Hello everyone, this is Mike Dowding with the SD Mines Physics Department and we're going to be starting Chapter 8 material today and Chapter 8 covers two main topics. The first is potential energy. The second is conservation of energy. And really Chapter 8 is going to be a, a good continuation of the Chapter 7 material. So what I'd like to do is uh, just refresh ourselves on what we had from chapter 7. We had kinetic energy, one half mv squared. So depending on how fast uh, mass was moving, there would be energy associated with that motion. We then had work, which had multiple variations of evaluating work. It really depended on uh, how the information was presented to us. So the first was the magnitude and angle approach. So if we knew the magnitudes of each vector and the angle that existed between them, we could use that method. Another means of evaluating the work if we knew the component values of each vector, then we could evaluate the work in this method. So this would be the components form. And then in the in one of the previous videos for chapter seven, when we started considering variable forces we could integrate the function for our force over a given displacement and that would allow us to find the work done by a variable force. Uh, now technically that method would also work for constant forces because uh, you can integrate a constant but if you, if you have a constant force, really the, the first or second method is probably going to be your better bet. But we now have uh, three different equations that can be used for evaluating the work done in a system. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of all this. And once we figure out how to evaluate the work in a system, the next step is to find out just how much work has been done on a given object because that net work will then be responsible for changing the kinetic energy in the system. So whatever amount of work that has been done is responsible for changing the kinetic energy which we can write out in the full form here and we call this the work energy theorem so work energy theorem so that's the chapter 7 review and that is actually a lot of stuff to come out of a single chapter but all of that material really just gets crammed into that one single expression so moving on to the chapter 8 material now we want to introduce a new kind of energy that we call potential energy and it would make a lot of sense if we used P to represent potential energy just because it starts with P and I have seen some books that do that however in the next chapter we're going to be using P to represent momentum well why don't we use M to represent momentum 
because we're using M to represent mass. So we're, we're starting to run out of letters of the alphabet here. And so we're just going to go ahead and use a letter that's not currently being used, the letter U. So this will, this will be our, our way of denoting potential energy in a given system. And with a new term comes a new definition. So what is potential energy? Well, it is energy with the potential to do work. And that is not helpful at all. It just sounds like a, a circular definition. What's potential energy? Well, it's energy with the potential to do something. So what I'm going to do to help us out with this is I'm going to go ahead and introduce the idea of conservation of energy right now. And we have something that is known as the first law of thermodynamics. And the first law of thermodynamics basically tells us that uh, whatever energy we have in a system, we cannot create or destroy any of that energy. In other words, uh, what, we, what we have is what we have. So conservation of energy. We cannot create or destroy energy in our system, but we can transfer or transform that energy. Okay, well, the, uh, the transfer or transformation of energy, that's what we've been calling work this whole time. And in chapter 7, we know that if we do work, there will be a change in kinetic energy. So let's try applying that to this conservation of energy definition. Let's go back to the cliff, and we will drop a ball or a rock off the top of this cliff. And we're going to start with an initial velocity of zero. We release the ball from rest. And then when that ball reaches the ground, there will be some final impact velocity, which we can, we can solve for if we know what the displacement of the ball is. So we'll go ahead and say that this cliff is a height of h, which means that the ball has to displace h in the downward direction. And the reason that ball displaces is because it is under the influence of gravity. And so we know that work will be done by gravity in the amount of MGD cosine of zero because our displacement vector and our uh, weight vector are pointing in the same direction. So we have work in the amount of MGD. That work has to be responsible for changing the kinetic energy of the ball. And anytime we have a delta, that implies a final minus an initial. The final kinetic energy is going to be based off of the final velocity of the ball when it impacts the ground. The initial kinetic energy will be based off of the ball's initial velocity, but that was zero. So our initial kinetic energy is going to be zero.
and that change in kinetic energy has to equal the work that was done, which is MGD. And at this point, we can rearrange things to solve for that final impact velocity, if in fact that's something that we want to solve for. It would be root of 2GD. But here's the part that I'm really interested in. It's that we somehow started with zero kinetic energy, and then we magically ended up with some non-zero amount of kinetic energy. So is this just magic? Did this energy come from nowhere? And our conservation of energy expression says, well, no, you can't do that. You can't just create energy out of nothing. So if we can't create this uh, finite amount of final kinetic energy, then the only, the only answer is that it must have already existed in some other form. And that brings us back to this idea of transferring or transforming energy from one type to another. And the way that we're going to uh, fix this little issue of uh, magically having our kinetic energy change. So we know that there is a kinetic energy associated with the initial and final locations of this ball or rock. But I'm also going to assign a potential energy at those locations as well. So U is the letter that we're going to use to denote potential energy. Just like the kinetic, we're going to have initial and final values. And our conservation of energy equation says we can't create or destroy. Uh, we just have to keep track of all of the energy that we're using. So up here I have some energy that is in the form of kinetic and potential. Then when the ball falls down to the ground, we have to have exactly the same amount of energy for the combined kinetic and potentials at the final location. Now this, this does not mean that our initial and final kinetic energies have to be the same, because they're not. And we've already shown that over here. We started with zero kinetic energy, we ended with a non-zero value, so we know that those values are not the same Likewise, we're not going to expect that the initial and final potential energies are the same either. So what does this equation mean? Well, let's, uh, let's hit this with some algebra. Let's subtract the initial kinetic energy term from each side, and let's subtract the final potential energy term from each side. And I'm just doing this so that I can get kinetic energies on one side and potential energies on the other side. Now what we get on the, the right hand side there is a final minus initial which can be written as delta K. On the left hand side, um, we have the difference in these two energies, but it's not 
final minus initial. So I can't I can't really get away with calling this delta u unless I maybe sneak a minus sign out front. Because then with that minus sign If we carry that minus sign through, we get exactly what is up here. We have initial minus final. So that's what we want. And what this expression tells us is that as one type of energy is changing, the other type is going to change in the opposite amount. So if I have a kinetic energy that is increasing, the potential energy has to decrease such that the total energy in the system remains constant. So back up to our picture. So this means that there has to be some finite non-zero amount of potential energy present in the system at that initial location. And well, what about the, the final location? Is there some final potential energy down at the ground? And at this point, all we know for sure is that any change in those potential energy values is going to have to match up equal and opposite to any changes in the kinetic energy. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go back to our values of kinetic energy at the top of the cliff and at the bottom of the cliff. And I'll go ahead and redraw our picture here. We started at the top of the cliff with an initial velocity of zero. And so that means we have an initial kinetic energy of zero. And then when the stone gets to the ground, we have a final kinetic energy. But that final kinetic energy has to be based off of the work that was done. And the work that was done for this falling object was gravity. So the work that was done by gravity was MGD. That has to equal the change in the kinetic energy, but the initial kinetic energy was zero, and so we have the value of our final kinetic energy. So let's put that into the conservation of energy expression. Conservation of energy says what you start with is what you end with. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out, well, what kind of, what kind of expression can we use to describe those potential energies? And for that, we're just going to use the work. Because we started with zero kinetic energy. We ended with a kinetic energy that was equal to MGD. So what happens if we get our potential energy terms on one side of the expression? Well, we get the negative delta U expression, which is exactly what we wanted. We have the equal and opposite relationship going on. But now I'm going to take this idea of a change in potential energy, and I'm going to relate it to the work that was done doing that, we see that the change in the potential energy, sorry, my cat's being a 
pain in the butt at the moment. We're going to take that change in potential energy and well, we know that that change in potential energy is equal to MGD, but we have two unknown values here. Knowing the difference between the two, that, that's okay, but really I want to know specifically what are the values at the beginning and ending of this rock falling some distance H or D. In this case it's D. So here's what we'll do. We're going to cheat. When the ball gets down to the ground, is the ball going to go any further? And the answer is probably no. The ground, the ground should stop the ball and that means the ball is no longer going to displace, it's no longer going to move, there's no longer going to be any work done, which means there will no longer be any transfer of energy. So what is the potential for work to continue happening once the ball gets to the ground? And the answer is none. The ball, the ball no longer has the potential to displace. And so the ball no longer has the potential of work being done on it. And that's our definition of potential energy. It's energy with the potential to do work. In other words, the ball gets to the ground and we've run out of potential energy. So we're going to go ahead and assign zero potential energy at the ground. And the moment we do that, we have our answer. So what is the potential energy at the initial position? Well, it is equal to MGD. And now if we, if we bring this back to the definition of potential energy, we say that this is energy with the potential to do work. So if I were to release this energy into the stone as it falls, gravity will do that much work displacing it to the ground. And then in turn, that energy will become kinetic because the, the, the stone is then in motion. And so now we have pretty much everything we need to start doing these uh, ba basically chapter 7 problems without the need for work. So I'll tell, I'll tell you what I mean by that here in just a second. I want to write out these, these two expressions. Now, over, over in the, the example that we had, we were using D as the displacement value. But really, the value that we had was the height of the cliff and we are going to displace that distance. And so really what we can do is we can say that the displacement is the height from which we drop. And this is what we call the gravitational potential energy. And because we have this specific name to the potential energy, this kind of implies that there will be other types of potential energy, and that will be the case. The important thing for us right now is to think of potential energy as energy 
that is stored for use at some later time. So if we, if we were to uh, hold, hold this rock out over the edge of the cliff and just and just hold it there in our hands there is a potential energy associated with that rock that is equal to mgh because once we let go of that rock that potential energy is immediately going to be released and it's going to convert into a kinetic energy by the time it gets to the ground and that conversion of energy is going to follow our conservation of energy expression. So just like we had uh, initial and final kinetic energies, we will also have initial and final gravitational potential energies and these will be based on the uh, physical location of our mass. So H naught and H final those are going to pertain to where the ball starts and where the ball ends and it's at this point that we we really need to stress the fact that these heights need to be measured from some predetermined location over here we said well we were just going to we were just going to let the the final position of the ball be where the potential energy was zero and that's fine, but we need to specify that. So we need to say down here at ground level, this is where our potential energy is going to be zero because this is where we typically start measuring our height. Usually we measure height from ground level and then we measure up. And so the, the initial height of the ball would just be h, whereas the final height would be zero because we, we are at the defined zero point of the system. So when it comes to potential energy, okay, potential energy must have a zero potential defined in the system. And these, these zero potentials, at least for gravity, they're kind of like the, the reference frames that we've been using in a lot of our, our problems. Um, it, it's kind of arbitrary as to where you set it up because in the end it's not so much the actual individual values of the potential that is important but the difference in the values because those have to add up and equal um, the same magnitude of the kinetic energy with the uh, the minus sign attached that we've seen. So very quickly what we're going to do is um, we're going to drop the ball again so to speak. So this will be our example problem for this lecture. We're going to drop the ball from rest so we have an initial kinetic energy of zero. There will be a corresponding potential energy which in order to get a value I need to know where the zero point for potential energy exists in this system. And just like the last 
problem, it makes a lot of sense to just let the zero point be at ground level. Because, you know, the, the, the rock's not going to go any further. Once it hits the ground, it's done. So we'll say that that's the zero point. And then anything that we try to measure in terms of potential energy, we just have to measure up. And so we would have positive potential energy everywhere uh, in this system because the ball is always somewhere above that defined zero point. So we, we bring in our definition of potential energy due to gravity. It's mgh, where h is measured from the zero point. In this case, it literally is mgh. And the ball is going to fall under the influence of gravity. So gravity is doing work. But here's the thing. Here's the, here's the really cool part about conservation of energy. When we are conserving energy in our system, we say what we start with is what we end with. Or if we want to rearrange stuff, we can say that delta K equals negative delta U. But back in chapter 7, we said that any change in kinetic energy was the result of work being done. That means that we can also say that any change in potential energy is also the result of the same amount of work that is done. But if you can keep track of all of your values of energy throughout the problem, then, well, we don't need to do work anymore. In other words, half the stuff that we did in Chapter 7 is no longer required. Because if we can keep track of all the different forms of energy that we have throughout the course of the motion of this ball that is falling, then we don't have to do work anymore. Well, let's see what we've got. We have initial energies that have to equal final energies. What do we have for the initial energies? Well, the kinetic energy was zero. The potential energy was mgh. The final energies, we, we are expecting that the ball will have picked up some speed along the way. And so there will be some uh, impact velocity which means we have one half mv final squared. But where are we at when we get to the ground? We're at the zero point for potential energy. And so we have zero potential energy left over. And this is our equation for conserving energy. We started with this much energy in the system, and we ended with the same amount of energy, it's just that it's in a different form now. We started with everything being in potential form, and it was converted to kinetic by the work that gravity does. But the great thing is that I don't even have to know how much work gravity does. I just need to know that the energy that I start with is the energy that I end with. At this point, we notice that the mass of the ball is common to both terms. And so what can we do here? 
Well, if we absolutely have to, we could say uh, this ball or rock, whatever it is, has a mass of five kilograms, and we dropped it off of a 30 meter tall cliff. So how fast is it going when it reaches the ground? Now we have uh, three ways that we could solve for this really. We could use um, kinematics to solve for the final velocity. We could use work we could look at how much work gravity does and how it changes the kinetic energy. Or we can use what we have right in front of us, which is the conservation of energy. If we rearrange this to solve for the final velocity, we get root 2gh. So we have 2, 9.8 and 30 calculator time don't forget to square root it and I'm getting a final impact velocity of 24.6 meters per second but other things I'd like to know um, well how much energy do we have in the system at any given time? In that case, I do need to know the mass because regardless of which side of the equation I choose to um, solve for, I need to know the mass. Um, at this point, it doesn't matter which side I solve for because I have all of the information, but like good students we should probably use given information as opposed to calculated materials so I'll just go with the initial expression that says all of the energy in the system is in potential form we have 5, 9.8 and 30 5, 9.8 and 30 in the calculator says that our initial potential energy, which is all of the energy in the system initially, this comes out to be approximately 1,472 joules. Potential energy is a form of energy, and so just like kinetic energy, just like work, we will have the unit of joules. So that's how much energy we have in the system. And this is how much energy all, always has to be in our system. Okay. This value must remain constant. Otherwise, we are not maintaining the definition of conservation of energy. So if we started with 1,472 joules worth of energy, how much kinetic energy does this stone have when it hits the ground? Well, all of that initial potential energy was converted into kinetic energy and so that final kinetic energy must equal 1472 joules there's there's nowhere else for that energy to go and now is where we have our our self check if this is the final velocity when we strike the ground then do these two values equal each other and we can check that very quickly we'll plug in the final velocity of 24.6 we'll square that multiply it by 5 divide it by 2 
and let's see, I think given a little bit of a rounding error, I want to double check my my numbers here. Uh, oh, here's my error. This should be 24.26. I was getting I was getting just a little bit too much energy there, and so that's that's why we have our self check. This is why we go back and check our work. And if these aren't matching up, we need to go back and and see where our errors are. So 24.26 squared times 5 divided by 2 equals 1,471.4, which, given a little bit of rounding error between the two methods, I would say that our self-check does, does in fact work. All right, I'm going to end the video here. In future videos, we're going to be using this expression quite a bit. Uh, we want we want to see if we can get away from actually having to do work in terms of the the three different methods that we had available to us back in chapter seven. Um, there's there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing our physics problems this way, but they still require quite a bit of information about the vectors in the system. And vectors are going to require things like reference frames to know what direction the vectors are pointing in, to know what the angle relationships are, but for energy, energy is a scalar. And if I can work my physics problems using nothing but scalar quantities, that is going to be so much easier. The, the less we have to deal with vectors, the better. And so we want to we want to see just how far this uh, conservation of energy idea can take us. So see you at the next video.